Often at funerals, I say to uh, the people there that we bury many sinners and few saints. Because my experience has been that uh, as you listen to eulogies and you have family and friends reflect on a person, you discover that they have, they have complexities. Uh, it could be the mother who, who really loved her kids, but her, wounds kept, her words kept wounding them uh, throughout their life. And so that comes out as they reflect on, the, on their relationship with their mum. Or it might be the person who in public was a very polite, well-mannered person, but actually in private there were terrible secrets that really nobody but the closest people knew. And uh, I think that's true of many people, is actually we have strengths and we have flaws. We're a mixture of complex desires uh, and also complex character. Some of, some of the things that we have in our lives, well, we, you might be able to put down to, say, mental health. But actually other things, and most things really, are a matter of character. So when we come to looking at Judas Iscariot, he's a complex man, isn't he? He's a man that's got a label on him, a label that's uh, throughout all of the Gospels. And the label is this, betrayer. He's the last person listed in the 12 disciples, and it's Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed Jesus. That's the label that's on him. That's the way that we remember him. But I think he's far more complex than that simple summary. I, in fact, as I've prepared this week, I've found it hard to understand Judas. He's complicated. I'm not sure what motivates him. And in fact, I'm not the only one, but as you read other Bible commentators, you'll find that they're the same. But maybe I shouldn't be surprised at the complexity of Judas because when it comes to sin, there's rarely any sense, mostly stupidity. Uh, you know, I remember when I was a, a lad and uh, my, say my mother told me off. She would say to me, what were you thinking? Uh, and the reality is I wasn't thinking. I was mostly pretty stupid. And I'd do these things out of a lack of thinking, a lack of sense. And maybe that's what's going on here with Judas in all of his craziness. When Jesus, Jesus said to his followers, the disciples that are gathered around him, as we heard in the reading, when Jesus said to them, uh, one of you will betray me, none of the other 11 would have said to themselves, that's Judas. He's been sneaky and I know that's the one that Jesus is talking about. That's not what they would have done. They would have gone around the room and thought, who of us is going to betray you, Jesus? They had no idea. And I believe that that's not necessarily because Judas was a masterful liar, but probably because Judas began with an honest commitment to Jesus. He began as a follower of Jesus. It's Important for us to not start at the end and call Judas a betrayer. He was firstly a follower. And there's no reason to doubt that in the beginning, at least, Judas had this sincere belief in Jesus. He left everything. All the disciples left everything that they had, their family, their financial security, and followed Jesus. He was one of those that Jesus sent out in, uh, in, in Matthew Sorry, Luke chapter 10, he sends them out and says, I want you to deliver people of demons and heal them in my name. Well, Jesus sent Judas out to do that very task. In other words, Judas was a man who preached. He was like a missionary. He saw healing happen through his prayers. He saw people delivered. He proclaimed the kingdom of God. This is where Judas started. Jesus, Judas had this unbelievable opportunity to experience this abundant life that Jesus offered. He got to see, for instance, Jesus work miracles. When Jesus fed 5,000 people, Judas was there. When Jesus calmed the storm, Judas was there. When Jesus delivered legion of his demons, Judas was there. He was there when Lazarus was raised to life. He was there through all of Jesus' miracles. He was there when Jesus taught. He got to hear Jesus' parables and his teachings. And not only that, 
He got a private session with our Lord Jesus afterwards. When the crowd didn't understand what was going on and what Jesus was teaching, Judas got to ask questions. He had Jesus explain to him what he needed to know. He agreed with Peter. When Peter declared for the disciples in, uh, in Matthew, he said, look, Matthew 16, all of us think that you are the Messiah, the Christ, the re- God's true rescuer. Judas was there in agreement with Matthew, uh, with Peter. And then on Palm Sunday, the one that we're celebrating today, Jesus, uh, Judas entered Jerusalem. He would have joined in the, in the crowd singing, Hosanna. He would have probably cheered people on as they threw down their cloaks. Maybe even he waved palm branches himself. And on the colt that Jesus rode on, it's possible that Judas took his cloak and lay it on that colt. Judas was firstly a follower. He was a brother to the other disciples. He was part of their family of faith. This is why none of them point him out. And then we come to this final conversation with Jesus. And Judas is not the follower now. He's now the betrayer. And you've got to ask yourself, where does it all go wrong? How does a follower end up in this place? Well, it is actually impossible to tell. And it's not just about the money. People talk about Judas. He goes to the chief priests and he asks for money to betray Jesus. Well, he was the group treasurer. And he was known in John uh, chapter 6, he is known for taking money out of the purse for himself. But at least according to Matthew, Jesus, uh, Judas offered to help the chief priests uh, find an opportune time to capture Jesus before any sum was agreed on. It wasn't about the money for Judas. I think possibly it was firstly about the disappointment. Judas was disappointed in Jesus. We see him when Jesus is anointed by this woman of this expensive perfume. It's a year's worth of perfume that she pours on Jesus' feet as an act of worship. And Judas is the one that calls that out. And he says, that could have been spent on the poor, even though he had no intention himself to spend it on the poor, but probably spend it on himself. He calls Jesus out. For such a wasteful expense. And it makes me wonder if at this point uh, there's been this growing disappointment in Jesus. Here he is wasting, in a sense, money on himself. Could it be that Judas found that Jesus was not the Messiah he was expecting? That this kingdom that Jesus was speaking of, which I suspect Judas was hoping, because Jesus told him this would be the case, that there would be 12 rulers of the tribe of Israel, and each one of his disciples would be those rulers. Well, Judas would have been hoping to have a seat among the, that ruling uh, crowd, but it turns out that the kingdom is not what Judas wanted. And the role he might have wanted in life, he's found his way into being the group treasurer. He probably wants more than just being the treasurer. Well, he finds out along the way that this role that he might want is not what Jesus is going to deliver to him. And maybe, just possibly maybe, Judas was concerned for Israel. That here is Jesus bringing, building up people's hopes, stirring up crowds, yet actually he won't deliver. And in fact, maybe the nation will get in more trouble, not less, because of Jesus. It's impossible to know what motivated Judas. But what we do know is he is a mixture of ambition, of self-interest, of political motivation, of idealism, of pragmatism. Judas is a complex man. And who knows what motivates him? But something has crept into his heart. From those first times when he followed Jesus and was called by name to be one of the twelve, something has crept in Jesus' heart. So he's gone from that follower to now being being prepared to betray the one he loved. And I don't know if you noticed today, but when the disciples say, Is it I, Lord? 
Jesus asked them, one of you is going to betray them, betray me. Is it I, Lord, they asked themselves. And it's actually Judas who uses a different name for Jesus at this point. He says, is it I, Rabbi? In the book of Matthew, Matthew never puts the word Rabbi in any faithful follower's life, uh, mouth. It's always the people who are the crowds or the Pharisees. And so Judas, even here with his language, betrays himself. He's moved from being a brother to now being a betrayer. In the Gospels, Luke and uh, John write of what enters Judas's heart. And they say this, that the devil had already put her on the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. That's, written, that's found in John 13. And it's already been put on Judas's heart by Satan to betray Jesus. Like every Christian, Satan is very persistent in attacking the followers of Jesus. Every Christian knows this. Peter warns us about this in his letters. And so some might say, well, did Judas even have a chance if Satan was against him, bringing assault to him? Well, an easy response to that is, yes, Judas had a chance. But he opened the door to Satan and all that persistent attack through his choices. He did this through his stealing. He did this by keeping secrets about his behavior. He did this by breaching trust. He did this by making a deal with the chief priests who are enemies of Jesus. And finally, he did this by sitting down with Jesus at that last supper. And Jesus calling out and said, one of you are going to betray me. And Judas does not own his sin in front of his master, his rabbi, but instead keeps up the pretense and offers the cup, takes the cup from Jesus. And it says there, at that, bit, at that point, John writes this, Then Satan entered into Judas Iscariot. At the point of that exchange, when finally Judas had hardened his heart to Jesus so much that there was nothing more than for Satan to enter into him. Little by little, choice by choice, continually listening to Satan's lies. This is how Judas ends up with Satan entering him. For those of us who are followers of Jesus, and we want to stand in the light, if you have no secrets, then the darkness cannot have any hold on you. Satan's attacks cannot get to you. If you keep short accounts with your sin, an open line with your God, confession and accountability, then Satan will not come in. But unconfessed, unconfronted, unrestrained sin brings people under Satan's power. It's hard to make sense of Judas. But I find it hard to make sense of Jesus too. By John chapter 6, Jesus, Judas, Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him. Yet, he had selected him to be one of his uh, innermost group, his 12. He had appointed him, I suspect, to be the group's treasurer. He knew, I presume, that Judas stole from the purse. He knew, I presume, that Judas was about to betray him at that last supper. And yet, he doesn't call Judas out. He doesn't name his sin. He doesn't tell him to stop. He lets him do his thing. Don't you find that Strange of Jesus. It's hard to make sense of that. But one thing I can see is that in all of these things, Jesus is offering Judas grace, an opportunity for grace. At the point where Judas is appointed to be one of the twelve, here's an opportunity of grace to live as one of the twelve. To live as a faithful follower 
of Jesus. At the point where Jesus appoints, puts this man into the role of treasurer, this is Judas' opportunity to let go of his ways of stealing and instead to do what is right with other people's money. At the point where uh, Jesus asks him the question, one of you will betray me, and Judas says to him, is it I, Lord? That was Judas's opportunity to say, it is I, Lord. He could have confessed and repented at that point. And in that final offer, the cup, Jesus offers him the cup, stretches out across the group, and gives to him this cup as an offer of repentance. And Judas drinks it and says nothing. That's what I at least can see in the restraint of Jesus. And not calling him out and not kicking him out. There's opportunity for Judas to find a new way. Yet, what Judas does is he steps away from Jesus. He keeps up the false pretense. And he, he missed what Jesus was on about, I think. Somehow he missed the major lesson in the prodigal son story, which is you are never too far from God that he can't accept you back. You're never too far. You can be off doing crazy things in a far-off country like the prodigal son was, but you can come back. Why would I say this? Because there's another betrayer in the band of disciples that we know of. His name is Peter. We know he's a betrayer. He can't have the courage to confess Jesus in front of a slave girl. He denies Jesus three times. He's not found at the most important moments in Jesus' uh, final crucifixion. He's a betrayer. And in his betrayal, we know that he runs off absolutely disgusted with his own behavior. It was predicted of him and he lived true to the prediction. Absolutely disgusted. But something in Peter says he can find forgiveness and grace in Jesus. When he hears that Jesus is risen to life again, he doesn't run away. He runs towards the tomb. He's eager to see his Lord again. When Jesus in John 21 starts to call him out and say, do you love me, Peter? Peter doesn't turn away. He turns towards Jesus knowing what he's done. But knowing that Jesus is inviting him back. It doesn't matter how far you are from God, you are never too far from the forgiveness of God. And somehow Judas, for all of his inside story, missed that point. Reminds me of so many people who sit in church, especially children. They might have grown up in your families and have grown up and heard the good news of Jesus, sat in Sunday school, heard about this prodigal son and God's kindness. Every Easter celebrated the forgiveness of God, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And yet right now, they have forgotten all of that. They remember maybe the moral lessons, but not the grace and kindness of God. Because somehow they missed the point. I think for Judas, he missed it because of what was going on inside him. The voices in him were too loud to hear the whispers of what God was talking about. And maybe that's true of folk who've grown up in church too. That could be you, by the way. You could be that person. Just like Judas, uh, seeing and experiencing the abundant life of Jesus, but you're on the outside of it all. You're watching in. And it hasn't struck you that it doesn't matter how far you are from God. You're never too far from his forgiveness. You haven't come home to him yet. That could be you. And uh, it could be you, especially if you're a, a young person just trying to decide for yourself. Well, heed Judas's life. The end of his story is tragic because Judas does come to his senses. He, he, he realizes that what had happened to Jesus was not what he intended, and that they were actually going to kill Jesus. And so he goes to the chief priests, 
and he appeals to them. And he says, I didn't intend this. This is an innocent man. You shouldn't kill him. And he throws those 30 pieces of silver on the ground. And you know what? There is no grace or kindness for him in that temple. They shun him. They just ignore him. Judas didn't run to the right person. And so in his despair and his self-disgust, sadly, he takes his own life. This, this story is nothing but tragic and doesn't have to be your story. Don't run to anything else. Run to Jesus. Run to the fact that he, he is telling the truth when he says that he died for the forgiveness of sins. And it's not theoretical. He died for the, the forgiveness of Judas's sins, Peter's sins, my sins, your sins. Don't run from God. Run to him. And for us all, we need to not presume that our secret sins won't be found out. You know, Judas did all these things in quiet, and Jesus didn't call him out. But it was coming, wasn't it? God knew. God knew what was going on. And for those of us who are wrestling with secret sins, and we think, oh, nothing's happened yet. I've not been found out. Who knows whether the, this delay is not God's patience towards you. That God is holding back his judgment in your life so that you might repent. That he's been patient with you so that you might come to your senses now and let go of the things that are holding you back in him. Judas, what a story, what a complicated man. So sad. We need to heed, heed the lessons that we hear in Judas's life. And also, we need to respond more like Peter does. Because here's the thing. If Jesus could go around the circle of your room right now, he could point you out and say, one of you is my betrayer. And go around the circle and you could say, is it me, Lord? And the reality is, you and I both know, yes, it is me, Lord. We Actually, our native language is betrayal. We are people who are more like Judas than maybe we want to admit. More like Peter than we want to admit. We should admit it. Because when we admit it, Jesus holds out that cup to us so that we might take it and come back to him.